This is the Prince's Highway. Its 2,000 kilometer length runs from Sydney to Port Augusta in South Australia. It is a long but scenic route that on the 4th of September 2005 became the scene of one of the most appalling crimes Australia had ever witnessed. The actions of one man that night would destroy a family. I don't wish death on him because I want him to suffer. Where are the kids? You're in the water. Hey. A three-month police investigation would point to the unthinkable. The facts at the time were a vehicle had left the roadway, um, travelled um, across um, the embankment, through a fence uh, and into the dam. We set up lighting and we didn't find any marks. Um, and that concerned me greatly. Detectives and the public were faced with a stark choice. Was it an accident or something worse? And I don't think after you listen to Farquharson, you can come to too many other conclusions other than he killed his kids. The murders committed by Robert Farquharson were crimes that shook Australia. On the evening of Father's Day, September 2005, a car was driving along this highway. Inside were a father and his three sons. Suddenly, it veered off the road and into a dam. The aftermath of that tragic event would stun the nation and leave the family devastated. When you lose a child, let alone three, you die yourself. I've found that I died with my children and I haven't had a life since. It's really affected my life greatly, hugely. And it's destroyed her, totally. It's, it's a cruel thing to have to live with, knowing that you were this person 10 years ago. You're a totally different person. About an hour's drive west of the city of Melbourne lies the rural township of Winchelsea. With a population of around 1,500, the peaceful community would, in 2005, be thrust unwillingly into the media spotlight. I think Winchelsea's um, an interesting place. It's your typical semi-rural, rural community. It's a place where people tend to be born there and stay there. And, they go to school there, they marry people that they know from the loca local area, and they tend to live in the area where they were born and not move far away. Cindy Gambino had known Robert Farquharson since they were teenagers. After her previous boyfriend was tragically killed, what started as a friendship developed into a romance, with Cindy initially attracted to the well-liked Robbie Farquharson. It was an attraction that wouldn't last. Cindy and Robert uh, met when she was a, a youngster. Robert was a local lad that she knew from around the traps. Everybody knew little Robbie Farquharson. And he was one of those guys in the group. He was not seen as a particular love interest on Cindy's part. There was no real physical attraction there. And that's how I knew I'd settled for second best. But there was security there. He was just solid, reliable Robbie that was always around, offering her lifts, giving her a lift home from the pub, giving her a lift from the local disco. He was Mr Solid, Mr Reliable, that was never going to want to move away from Winchelsea, which suited her fine. And there's the I fell pregnant six months into the relationship, and that's when things started going downhill. The belly. The belly. And Rob was... Really, he was like a big mummy's boy. He'd stayed at home a lot longer than his friends. When he found Cindy, she already had somewhere to live. She was already independent. And he sort of sees that strength in her, you know, that she can look after him. And he sort of treated her like his mum. There was a lot of things that he wouldn't do. I remember the first time I went shopping on my own and left Jay with him, and Jay was just a new baby. 
and come home and Jay was in a dirty nappy and he wouldn't change the nappy. Never ever got up during the night to the children. It was always me. She and Rob had been together, I think, for about six years then when they decided to, uh, to tie the knot. Even on her wedding day, when people were fussing around her, saying, you know, smile, this is fantastic, this is such a big day for you, she was having second thoughts. Robert and Cindy were married in the year 2000. By then, they had two children, Jay and Tyler, and were joined two years later by their third child, Bailey. Even in the early stages of the marriage, flaws in Robert's character were beginning to emerge. I think he was dissatisfied with his life. I think he was resentful that he had to go to work, he had to get a second job. But I think he was quietly angry with Cindy too because she was a very strong woman and it was that strength that he resented. The financial pressure that Farquharson found himself under inevitably took its toll on family life. He was actually very angry and he, he would rile the kids, he would rouse the kids up. He did. It was passive aggressive behavior where he would, he would wind them up to the point that Jay, the older one, would sit and cry. He would, he would do that until they burst into tears and then the little boy would go in his room and slam the door. He would stir them up till they got to a point where they were so angry with him they had no respect for him whatsoever. That's actually sadistic and it's quite cruel. He sort of was wearing his own anger out, projecting his own anger onto everyone around him. With Robert increasingly disenchanted with his job and family life, his marriage to Cindy began to disintegrate. In May 2004, Cindy met single father Stephen Mools, a local contractor who was working on their property. Stephen himself had only recently come out of a traumatic breakup, and he now found himself in the middle of another one. Cindy and um, Robert's relationship was, was sinking. When Stephen came on the scene, I think he became a bit of a confidant where she would say, you know, I'm not really that happy, what do you think? And he, he didn't really want to get involved in that. And she made it very clear that, you know, she thought something of me. I said, well, I'm sorry, but you're married and uh, I've just come out of a very ugly relationship. It's just not happening. Eventually, I... Um, became aware that they were separating. Rob would come around to my house nearly every night and I was trying to counsel him. I guess as a single dad of two boys himself, doing it hard for Stephen, it was very frustrating and irritating to watch Robert grizzling and moaning and doing nothing to move forward. After, it was a good couple of months, I got to the point where I went, you know what? You're an idiot. You don't want your wife back. Stephen actually had quite a scene with him where Stephen was saying, you know, pull your socks up. You're not a father. You're not even being a father. You know, you're like you're being a big baby. Grow up and, and act like a father. I, I'm not trying to take your place. I don't want to be you. I've got my own children. But you, if you want to be a father, start behaving like one. So it was, it was quite a sort of toxic triangle that he really didn't want to be involved in. Cindy asked Robert to leave their home in November 2004, sure that their marriage was over. He always said to me when we had a third child, oh, this is going to wreck our marriage, and I couldn't work out why a third child would wreck our marriage. And it wasn't the third child that wrecked our marriage, it was him. All I wanted to do was be married and have children, but I just married the wrong person. While she began a new chapter in her life, Robert struggled to cope with the breakdown of the relationship. He was saying that they'd separated, but it was a mutual thing, that they had separated on good terms and that he was moving on in his life. That wasn't actually true at all. That was completely untrue. He was very angry. He was stalking Cindy. He was always looking for whether my car, where my car was and who I was with. It was... Not a nice feeling. Well, we'd see his car go past overnight, and then he'd obviously go around the block, and all of a sudden we'd see it again. And be like, well, what is this guy doing? It was 
behaviour that was consistent with someone who had obsessive, maybe even possessive thoughts. And I remember I used to say to Cindy, you know, is he, is he all together? There was a moment a few days before, it was a Wednesday night and he rang me and he wasn't doing very well. He was really depressed. And I spoke to Stephen's mother about it and she said, just watch out. That pricked my ears up. But I thought he was suicidal, not homicidal. However increasingly bizarre and disturbing Robert's behavior was becoming, it always seemed to be directed towards Cindy. And so when Father's Day 2005 came round, there was never any suggestion that his children would be in any sort of danger. After I said goodbye to the kids and drove off, I didn't think that was going to be the last time I'd ever see my kids. Cindy and Robert Farquharson split up in late 2004. As divorce proceedings began, the pair tried to ensure the breakdown of the family had as little effect as possible on their three children, Jay, Tyler and Bailey. Jay absolutely loved football. He had a dry sense of humour. He was a good kid, very responsible. Jay was an extremely intelligent little boy very focused on where he wanted to head in life, wanted to be a fireman. Tyler was mum's boy. He would come up and just turn the vacuum cleaner off and I just want to give you a hug, mum. I could see, by the way he was towards me, that there was something missing from Dad. Could you take a picture? There was definitely something missing from Dad, whether it was cuddles, whether it was bedtime stories, combination of all of the above, I don't know, but there was something missing. Bailey, on the other hand, Bailey, no. He was just a really magnetic little boy. Yay! He took to me like a duck does to water. He loved Stephen to bits. He just. Didn't have a chance. Father's Day in 2005 began like any normal day. The whole day started so well. Cindy spent the morning with her own father, took her children to see her own dad, and then she took the children uh, to Rob. I'd had a photo of the three boys blown up for him for when he got a home. She was making their beds, getting their school lunches ready, getting their bags and their uniforms ready for the next day, and the clock's ticking, and where are they? Next thing I hear the car pull up, which sounded exactly like his car. I thought, oh, here they are now. And it was him. He lobbed on my doorstep and said, I've killed the kids. So what do you mean? Where are the kids? Why are you here? Why did you leave them? Where are they? Stephen was at his, his house and um, she telephoned him straight away and said, there's been an accident, the kids are in the water. None of it was making any sense. I got a phone call and my cousin, Aaron, actually answered it. And uh, he held the phone away from his ear and went, I think it's Cindy, Steve, and she's screaming. Handed me the phone. I held the phone and she's screaming, the kids are in the water, the kids are in the water. I'm going, what kids? Cindy jumped in her car with Robert and headed out into the night, still unaware of exactly what had happened to her three children. The only thing she could determine was that Robert's car had crashed into a dam on the outskirts of town. While Robert had escaped the vehicle, her three sons were trapped inside. Unbeknownst to her, the car had, by that point, already been underwater for almost 30 minutes. All I do remember is turning onto the highway and by the time I'd hit the roadhouse, I was doing 145 clicks. Oh, I just remember saying I had to get to my kids. 
It was 7.45 when they arrived at the dam, followed minutes later by Stephen. Still, no one was aware of the terrible fate that had befallen the three children. Cindy's car's parked there. Rob's car's nowhere in sight. Cindy was hysterical, just running up and down, up and down, up and down. What's going on? You know, where are the kids? They're in the water. Instantly, from the second of seeing him, you got to smoke. I said, what? My initial thought is, hang on. You're telling me your kids are in the water. You're asking me for a smoke. There's something not right about you. Where are the kids? I said, get out of my face or I'll fucking kill you. I jumped in the water and I'm trying all these different spots and, yeah, obviously to no avail. We wouldn't be sitting here today. It was only shortly after that that the services arrived. They started unloading ropes and this and that, and as soon as I saw a rope, I went, yep. And I grabbed a rope and started tying it around my waist, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going back in. At least I got a rope this time. No, 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 you don't know. Well, I was the first ambulance to arrive on the scene. Um, I was actually pointed out to um, Robert Farquharson. I, I found out that he'd been the driver of the um, vehicle. And at that, at that time, there was um, three kids trapped in the car in the, um, in the dam. I remember glancing up. I glanced up a few times, actually, to see where he was. And, um, you yeah, know, I remember he was um, up at Cindy's car, had his legs slightly spread and his arms folded, just, just looking. And not even comforting Cindy. I remember saying that to myself as well. Not even comforting Cindy. Cindy was hysterical, absolutely beside herself. His demeanour was a bit odd, I found. Like, the, the time I had with him, he never asked about the kids. Well, he said he'd been driving along Princess Highway. He had this, um, this coughing fit, which caused him to black out and um, career across the road and go into the dam. During the questioning, he turned around and said, no, I had a coughing fit. Now, at that stage, it got every alarm bell that I had going. People can have coughing fits and black out, but basically it's associated with quite often a heavy smoker who's got a disease process very similar to asthma. Now, it's something that when started doesn't disappear in five seconds or five minutes. It is something that when you look for and listen for, you'd have signs and symptoms to support what he stated. There was nothing I, I could find to support what he, what he said. Meanwhile, officers from the Victoria Police Major Collision Investigation Unit had arrived at the dam, and their years of experience investigating incidents on the roads was telling them something was amiss at the scene. Where motor cars run off the road, then the driver panics and he oversteers the car. They lose control and see those marks regularly on our roads. Um, so initially I thought that that's probably what would have happened. So we're, we're going to set up a lighting system back. Um, in the end, we went back nearly a kilometre along the road. We set up lighting and we didn't find any marks. Um, and that concerned me greatly. As police conducted their investigation at the scene, Farquharson was taken to a local hospital for a medical examination. Shortly afterwards, he was joined there by detectives determined to find out what had happened from the sole witness to the incident. I expected to see someone pretty bedraggled and, and uh, scared and upset, but he, uh, he was fairly calm. At that stage, I cautioned him. He um, sort of acknowledged that, and then he just went on. He told a story about how he, he turned on the heater, and the heater had started to make him want to cough. And he started to cough, and the next thing he realised, he crashed his car. The car rapidly sank, the, the kids didn't get out of the car, and he tried to get the kids out of the car by diving under the water. Now, at that stage, 
we really started to have our doubts about him because he just didn't look like a bloke who'd been diving under the water. Back at the scene, any hopes of a rescue operation had long since faded. At 12.40 a.m., some five hours after the car had plunged into the dam, the vehicle was found by a police diver. In it lay the three bodies of Jay, Tyler and Bailey. The vehicle was actually vertical, nose down into the, into the mud. The driver's side door was open and the eldest boy, Jay, his upper body was out onto the driver's side door. So he nearly got completely out of the motor car, which was, you know, upsetting for, I think, everybody there. So we winched the car out of the water. Of course, a huge amount of water ran out. The very first thing I saw was the ignition switch. Now, I thought it was very unusual that a person would, in the dark, have a coughing fit, drive out onto a dam and turn the ignition key off. And of course, the headlight switch was turned off. So why you turned the headlight switch off sort of astounded me also. So the gear shift wasn't in the drive overdrive position, it was in the direct drive position. Um, and it was a cool, cold night and the fan wasn't turned on. So for a person that was having a coughing fit and had a cold, um, not to have the heater on, I thought was really strange too. So a lot of factors in the car that, uh, and the three boys, of course, they were all out of their seat belts and that was, that was very disturbing to think that they'd got so close and just didn't make it. Whilst the evidence from the car and the scene was pointing to foul play, Farquharson's behavior at the hospital was fueling detective suspicions. At the completion of the interview, I had no doubt that something was terribly wrong. He only asked two questions, really. He said, oh, he said, I haven't been in a lot of trouble. I haven't been in a lot of trouble. So what's the scenario for me from here? And the other one was, what's going to happen to me? I was gobsmacked because they're not the sort of questions you'd be asking. Um, you know, what are happening with the kids? You know, they sort of cling on to hope and stuff like that. And they say, is there any chance that one of them might be all right? But he never did. By now, Cindy had been taken to hospital in Winchelsea, suffering from severe shock. The grim task of identifying her children fell to Stephen. Jay was in a body bag on the ground and um, I had a little... Had a little word to Jay. Said a prayer. And I remember saying to the coroner after that, I walked back over to the coroner and I said, this is shit. I said, duh. He said, yeah, it's in all the 30 odd years or something that I've been doing this job, I've never ever seen or been to anything as bad. I said, Tyler and Bailey are in the car, am I allowed to touch them? He said, no. Oh, okay, okay. And with that, I walked over to the car. I knew Bailey was gone, obviously, but I whispered in his ear, you know, you'll be safe. I left the hospital and uh, had a quick conversation with um, Jeff Exton. I said to him, something's dreadfully wrong here. And before I could more or less finish telling him what I thought was wrong with Mr. Farquharson, Jeff uh, had said to me, he said, um, it's no good down here. He said, it's, uh, he said, if he's saying that's what happened, that didn't happen. He said, there's something horribly wrong here. In September 2005, Victoria Police were investigating the deaths of three young children when their father's car crashed into a dam and sank. Ordinarily in a homicide investigation, police will have a crime and try to identify a suspect. 
In this case, they knew something had happened. They just didn't know if it was a crime. The facts at the time were a vehicle had left the roadway, um, travelled um, across um, the embankment through a fence uh, and into the dam. Um, the driver had got out, um, flagged down a car and gone back into town to raise the alarm, where he didn't um, partake in any of the rescue effort. And as detectives, that sort of raised some flags in their own mind as to um, are we dealing with a tragic accident or is there something more um, that needs to be further investigated? I made a list and on the top of the list I put uh, he did it or he didn't do it. And on the left hand side of the list I had a whole list of things that I wrote down which pointed towards him doing a deliberate act. And they were all along the lines of um, his demeanour, his dodgy story. Just the crash couldn't have happened the way he said it happened. The fact that the car was still under acceleration as it went into the, to the dam. The fact that um, when I'd gotten into the car and he told me that, uh, he told me that he'd turn the heater on, well, the heater was off. The lights weren't on, he'd turned the lights off and the ignition was off. The way that he, he wanted to be taken back to confront Cindy and tell her himself that the kids had been killed. And then I started in the he didn't do it. <laughs> and it was, I was really hard pressed and the only thing I could come up with on the uh, he didn't do it side was who could be this evil? Whilst the police carried on with their grim task, the family faced their own torment, the funeral of the three boys. The children were buried in Winchelsea Cemetery. Cindy had booked a burial plot for herself to be buried next to, next to her children one day. Unbeknown to Cindy, when they, when they booked the burial plots, Robert had booked a plot, a burial plot for himself next to the children and next to the wife that didn't want him anymore. It's the ultimate sick joke, I think, that he would be reunited with Cindy one way or the other. The true nature of Robert Farquharson was perfectly captured by a photographer at the funeral. There was a photograph of herself with Robert at the funeral, where they were clutching each other, they're propping each other up. With hindsight, that is sick too. Here, here she is being propped up by the man who's caused her all this pain. The following week saw Robert Farquharson interviewed by police, and he stuck to his story about a coughing fit, causing him to black out. However, the evidence that was being fed back to detectives from the dam was telling a different story. There were at least three steering inputs to get that vehicle from the road to the dam. The first steering input is to turn off the roadway itself. They found no marks on the road to indicate a vehicle um, had lost control, no skid marks, scuff marks. The second steering input is to straighten the front tyres up again to follow a straight path. And then the third steering input is to miss the tree. It's veered to the right just before it went into the, um, to the dam to avoid the tree that was there. If there was three steering inputs into the motor car and it's been accelerated across there. Clearly, Mr. Farquharson's not having a coughing fit. Clearly, Mr. Farquharson's not unconscious. And clearly, he uh, deliberately drove the motor car into the dam. As well as the forensic work being carried out, detectives were trying to determine if Farquharson's actions in the weeks and months leading up to Father's Day could reveal any clues as to what would happen that night. He found a focus for his anger, I think, in the material possessions, and the focus was on the, what he referred to as the shit car, that Cindy had even taken the best car and left him with the shit family car. And it seemed to him, though, that the division of the family finances was completely unfair. He was a known whinger, a known moaner, who said all sorts of outrageous things. So there were a few veiled threats to Cindy. I think Cindy, having lived with Rob all those years and listened to all that sort of stuff, thought it was just more of the same. She was concerned he was depressed, but she never dreamed for a moment that he would, was considering harming the children. And, of course, she was completely unaware of the conversation that he'd had with Gregory King 
outside the fish and chip shop three months before. Greg parked his car and Farquharson pulled up next to him or near him in his own car. And they were just talking. He'd got this festering anger towards Cindy over driving around in the, in the good car, as he called it. As he was talking to his friend Greg outside the fish and chip shop, Cindy pulled up in the good car. The essence of the conversation was that he was going to pay her back big time. Greg asked, what, what does he mean by that? He indicated that he would take away the most important things to her. And when Greg asked, what do you mean by that? Cindy was in the fish and chip shop with the kids and um, Farquharson has nodded towards the fish and chip shop, indicating to Greg um, that he meant the kids. And Greg was horrified and said, for God's sake, Robbie, you don't even think things like that, let alone say them. Nobody thinks things like that. That's your own flesh and blood. But at the time, Greg just put it down to just um, Farquharson blowing off steam. And, and I guess knowing him as well as he did, probably thinking that, um, not that he would never ever do that sort of thing. Greg King's statement was enough for police. On the 14th of December, 2005, Robert Farquharson was charged with murdering his three children. Throughout the investigation, Cindy had been kept informed of progress. But despite the mounting evidence, she still couldn't comprehend that Robert could be responsible. So on the day that um, we were going to charge him, yeah, I did go and see Cindy and let her know that that was the day he was going to be charged. And it was a very difficult time for Cindy. That was not what she was expecting. I was devastated because I couldn't believe he did it. I was in denial. They said, oh, we're charging him with triple murder. OK, fair enough. Jared said the same thing to um, Cindy. She just broke, absolutely hysterical, just broke. Yeah, she was beside herself as far as she was concerned. They were bastards and they were doing the wrong thing, charging him and this and that, and he loved his kids and blah, blah, blah. She still clung on to that belief that this had to be a terrible accident. There was no way anyone would do such a dreadful thing just to punish her for ending the relationship. She could not get her head around that. So right from the time Robert was charged, she was part of the campaign to clear his name. The case against Robert Farquharson, charged with murdering his three children in September 2005, was building. Police alleged he had deliberately driven his car into a dam and his sons had drowned. In August 2007, that theory would be tested in a highly publicised court case. And that's what the purpose of a trial is, is to test the evidence to determine guilt or innocence. Cindy was supporting Farquharson in the first trial and did want to believe still at that point that um, he would deliberately do this to their children. She was a gift to the defence. She was a gift in that trial because she said all the right things, but the evidence was overwhelming. It was a three-month investigation. There were things that we did to investigate the veracity of the story. We found a car that we put in the dam to test how long it was before it filled up with water. To me, that was very compelling that you had time where you could collect your thoughts, uh, collect the boys, work out a plan and say, well, this is how we're going to get out. Uh, he could have saved at least one of the boys. Inevitably, the whole trial was under the intense scrutiny of the Australian media with the court of public opinion even questioning the veracity of the witnesses. Members of the public couldn't believe that Farquharson could take his three children's lives in this, in this fashion. Um, and the negativity that we got on the internet from, from Facebook and those types of blogs that were set up was terrible. And affected me, got absolutely no doubt about that. Affected my family. Um, and, and it was a very, very stressful time. I've never been involved in a trial where the atmosphere has been so toxic. No one was conceding anything. It was almost like the defence's view was that we'd been sitting at home and we'd been told about three kids killed in a dam 
and we decided, well, I'd better stroll down to Geelong and see if we can find someone guilty of this. I just got the feeling that it just got personal. On the 2nd of October 2007, two days before what would have been Jay's 13th birthday, the jury retired to consider their verdict. Four days later, they found Robert Farquharson guilty of murdering his children. I was praying that he was innocent and when he was convicted, I broke down like I was taken away in an ambulance. Cindy and her mother both broke down. For myself, I had tears of joy running down my cheeks. I felt elated. I just thought, yes, you beauty. Farquharson received a life sentence for each of the three counts of murder. The judge refused to set a minimum term for parole. Cindy, meanwhile, was left to continue her search for answers. Answers that certainly weren't forthcoming from Robert in jail. He doesn't call her, he won't let her be on the visitors list, he won't respond to her letters. She hears that other people, other friends are visiting him, and yet he won't see her. And she started to think, as I think she said to me once when I was there, you know, why do you think he won't respond to my letters? I said, why do you think? She said, well, it's not that I think he's guilty, but perhaps he just doesn't want to look at me. Why wouldn't he want to look at you? Why can't he face you? She said, well, I'd know if he were lying. I said, would you? Would you really know if he were lying? She said, I think I would. And maybe that's why he doesn't want to, to see me. And I thought then, somewhere in there, she's already, the thought is germinating, somewhere in there, that he just might not be telling the truth. There was an initial time where she said, I feel as though he might have done it. She was in doubt for a long, long time until she put all those variables together and all those little bits of facts here and there together. And then she finally conclusively said, I believe he's done. It was a weight lifted, but it was still a long road ahead. On the 17th of December, 2009, it was announced that Robert Farquharson had successfully appealed his conviction. One of the things that came out of the publicity for the retrial was we actually identified a significant witness who came forward in relation to having been on the highway um, at the time that Farquharson's car was on the highway and saw um, pretty much the car go off the road. Dawn Waite was a farmer's wife from Warrnambool who had been driving along the highway that night behind Robert. She didn't come forward in the first trial because she'd been diagnosed with cancer. She knew he'd been arrested. She felt that she was just another witness. They had a strong enough case. Uh, after seeing the coverage of the appeal where he was released pending a new trial, she felt that what she had to say was crucial. What she described was a man on a mission. He was slowing down and braking, slowing down and braking, as though he was pausing. She decided to overtake him because she felt he might cause an accident. But as she overtook him, she noticed he was transfixed looking to the right. He was just, he wasn't even aware of her passing. He was just fixed looking to the right. He, it, he wasn't coughing when she passed him. He wasn't in the midst of a coughing fit. She looked in a rear vision mirror and she saw the headlights of the car turning off the road to the right. Now, that was the car turning off the road and heading towards the dam. This was not a man slumped over the wheel or coughing in the midst of a coughing fit, as he claimed. It showed him slowing down over a distance, constantly slowing down, driving off, slowing down, driving off, and looking to the right. A man that was looking for that dam. It, it, it changed everything. Dawn Waite's statement to police was enough for Cindy. She was now convinced Robert was responsible for the deliberate murder of Jay, Tyler and Bailey. She contacted the police and changed her statement. It, this is too un incomprehensible. I can't believe that this person would hate me that much to want to murder his own children who he worshipped the ground they walked on. The second trial of Robert Farquharson began on the 5th of May 2010. And for the second time in three years, he pleaded not guilty to three counts of murdering his sons. Tellingly, Cindy chose to give evidence against her ex-husband. She was dreading it, absolutely dreading this second trial. But when it came, she said, I was Robert's voice first time round. I spoke up for him. I, I was loyal to him and I was misguided. 
but second time around, my children will have a voice and I will be their voice. As powerful and moving as Cindy's testimony was in court, a defining moment came when the accused took the stand. Farquharson was put in the box and he had a shovel and he dug himself a hole and he never got out of it. I think his evidence was just unbelievably bad. He had clear memories of things that would suggest that he was innocent and every time things were put to him about, well, how, how do you say this could happen? Oh, I don't know, I've forgotten. Can't remember. I can't remember was like his biggest answer, I think. He gave it and like he'd lost his push bike. You know, it wasn't, it, we weren't talking about the three kids and I think the jury probably saw what we saw at the hospital. And I don't think after you listen to Farquharson you could come to too many other conclusions other than he killed his kids. The day the jury delivered the verdict was significant because it was, would have been Tyler's birthday. And for, uh, for Cindy, that was like a message. We went and lit a candle at the church and prayed for the truth to come out. On the 22nd of July, 2010, on what would have been Tyler's 12th birthday, Robert Farquharson was found guilty again of murdering his sons. He received a life sentence with a minimum term of 33 years. He's going to be 70 old when he gets out, if he gets out. Why should he get out? They can't. They were put in a box. They can't get out, ever. So why should he? There's no closure for me. It's always there. From the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed. It's always birthdays, it's always anniversaries. Mummy, do it. I hate him with a passion. I don't wish death on him because I want him to suffer. I hate him more. I hate what he's done to me. Turn around. Hey, turn around. <laughs> Wave to Mummy. I hate him. <laughs> I believe this crime was so shocking because it was out and out revenge. I think it all comes down to, I don't think you realise the value of having a child. Consequently, there's three little boys gone. When two people separate, don't use the children as pawns because you might be that person's ex, but you're not your children's ex. Cindy said to me once, do you think he, he didn't love them? I said, I think he did love them. I think he hated you more. <laughs>